Hello, everyone, and welcome to our field service webinar sponsored by Aquan, how AI drives service performance at 3D Systems. I'm really happy that everybody could join us today. And before we begin, I'd like to bring your attention to the console that's laid out in front of you. Now, all of the windows and widgets that are right in front of you can be repositioned. They can be maximized or even minimized to fit the device you're using to connect with us today. Now, if you accidentally minimize a window, don't worry, it happens to the best of us. Simply pop into the menu dock that's located right at the bottom of your screen, and you can bring that window right back up. Now, on that same menu dock, you'll find the Resource Center. And in that center, you can access documents related to not only this webinar content, but important information also about our upcoming Field Service Amelia Island event, which is taking place next month, August 19th to the 21st. And that date is coming up really quickly. So if you are interested in registering, um, want information, and you know, haven't received any of it yet, uh, please don't miss out. You can email us at webinar at wbresearch.com as well to get more information. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today. We're joined by Mark Hessinger, the VP of Global Customer Services at 3D Systems, and Chris Karen, VP of Global Sales at Aquant. We're going to try to save some time at the end of today's discussion for a quick audience Q&A. So please feel free to submit questions at any time during the presentation for Chris and Mark using the Q&A portal on your menu doc. Please do not be shy. And now without further ado, that's about enough from me. I'm going to pass the mic over to Chris. So Chris, the floor is yours. Great. Uh, thank you, Elise, and thank you for hosting us today. I've been looking forward to the session to talk about the service transformation that's underway at 3D Systems. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Mark Kessinger, who's been in a, in a service position for his entire life, but for the last two and a half years has been at 3D Systems, helping them to advance their service operations. Mark, uh, with your permission, I'll, I'll hand off to you to, to introduce 3D Systems. Okay, thank you, Chris. Yes, Mark, Mark Kessinger with 3D Systems start with giving a little background on 3D systems. So we make 3D printers and all the solutions around them. A lot of people think 3D printing is, is somewhat new, but it was actually invented back in 83 by one of our founders, Chuck Hull, in uh, Valencia, California. And uh, the company's developed over time. It's acquired a lot of other companies over time in the technology. And we provide hardware, material, software, and solutions for, for additive manufacturing. The additive manufacturing, uh, a number of years ago, it was mainly prototypes, but it's really at an inflection point and is becoming more and more uh, used in production. So our solutions are supporting that from digitizing information to, to, to preparing it for manufacturing to making parts inspecting and then managing the whole process. And it all evolves around the customer, what are the customer needs and what do we need to, to do to support them. As customers start using this technology more and more in production, it's also important that we shift our services because the, the response time, the, the uptime of the systems is much more critical when you're in a production environment. So that mean time to repair, mean time of response, is very important metric that we're looking to drive down and be best in class in this area. So as we're making the shift in, in our service culture from customers that were in prototyping mode to, to high level production, uh, first thing is skills gap. So we found uh, we have we have specialists in, in the different technologies, and, there, and there's a whole variety of different technologies we use in 3D printing. It's it's not just one standard. There's metals and there's various plastics, and so we we have our specialists spending too much time on simple problems and not able from the, the size of the support team to be able to tier those those issues. So. One of the challenges is how do we get the right people working on the right things, whether it's hardware, software, materials, applications, or user-related. The other thing, in, in industry, there's not a lot of people with uh, additive manufacturing experience. So as we bring people in, it's not just teaching the technology, but also how all these processes work. So we want to find ways to bring people up to speed quicker and be able to support our customers. And then... Uh, just from the evolution, and I've seen this here, 3D Systems Plus and other companies, been you have knowledge throughout the organization. 
how do you pull that together? So on the on the information, so it's it's scattered, siloed, and especially since we've acquired so many companies over the years, you've got all these different uh, pockets of information. We want to find a way to leverage that information and bring some of that knowledge to people so that we can uh, you know, all, all be solving problems consistently and much more efficiently and quicker to, to work with our customers. And now, a few years back, the company, that's about four years back, the company moved to Salesforce as a CRM platform. That has helped. So now we're capturing most of our data on cases in one system. So that, that's an advantage. And then as we add technologies, we have uh, Salesforce, front-end, Oracle, back-end. Our IT department likes that we stay within that ecosystem. We do as well because uh, as, as we add applications, we want to be focused on leveraging the value that the application brings and not working on interfaces. So just to, to get to some of the results, and then we'll go through during this uh, presentation how we got to these results, We've adopted the Quant tool, the AI tool, in certain platforms for 3D printing, and we've seen significant improvements. Uh, repeat visits, they have gone down, so we have less times that we're going on site to customers because we're doing better at triaging the issue, we're sending the correct parts, so when, and also the person with the right skills, so when we go on site, the chances for success are much higher. Then the parts consumption, which is, is also a big driver of improvement, the number of parts we send dramatically goes down because the confidence the team has that they're sending the part that will fix the problem is a lot higher. Um, and without leveraging this type of technology we've had here at 3D Systems and a previous company has been at see guys sending, I'm going to send two or three parts because it might be this, it might be that. They're, they're not all that, you know, sure what the issue is to, you know, that they have to resolve. So by, by showing them the, the confidence level we have that that is the right solution, it drives a different behavior in the organization. So, Stepping back again to 3D systems and a little higher view of how we're trying to engage with our customers. So the product life cycle, there's a de design phase, the prototype phase, pilot runs. 3D printing was used a lot in that prototype, but as we're moving across from left to right and we're starting to get to those production runs, we're seeing uh, a lot of good examples where 3D printing is being used in production. And then along the bottom, the flow on how we're supporting our customers with our technology and our applications. We get to that, underlying that to keep the, you know, the maximum ROI from that system, we need to be building a service organization that focuses on uptime and gets to a point that we're using predictive support models. So that strategy for service aligns with the whole direction of the company and the products and the solutions we're bringing out to market. What's important, uptime, and that the customer can use uh, their, their system when they want, to, when they want to use it. We focus in different verticals. We have expertise in these verticals. Uh, 3D printing, uh, since I've joined, I'm surprised how much we do in healthcare, how many spinal implants are printed every day. Uh, previously, if you needed to get a, a hip replacement or a knee replacement, you'd have to choose between small, medium, large. Now with 3D printing, they can make the exact part that you need for your body. Uh, it, there's been real advances, and we have centers in U.S. and Europe that work with doctors and provide support in these parts for them. And we have customers that use our technology to make themselves. In dental, uh, a lot of applications there. Invisalign liners, a lot of those are made every day. They're made on 3D systems printers. They're expanding their business globally, but that, that, that's another example where 3D printing. So every mouth is different, so, and you need different liners to, to drive you know, the behavior they want. So being able to customize every liner, and it's all printed differently, is, is a big advantage of this technology. And we've also released last year another platform in dental. So dental offices now, if you go into a dental office, it's possible 
you'll leave without having to come back. You won't have to make these, these funny molds. They'll just scan what they need to put in and they'll print it in the back room and bring it right out. Aerospace is another great application. That bracket there used to be 13 parts. It's now one part uh, made in aluminum. And every satellite that launches today has several of these brackets on there. So they've used the technology to reduce complexity, but also to, to create a much stronger part at a much lighter weight. Automotive, we have you know, large automotive companies that use this type of technology, but also all the Formula One racing cars, the NASCAR cars, they are using 3D printing. In Formula One, every two weeks there's a new race, and every two weeks there's a modification to the car, and they can do that because they can quickly adapt from what they're learning from all, all the readings they have in one race, what they need to change for the weather conditions and the track that's approaching them in two weeks. So rapidly changing and making things. And durable goods, can't see me today, but if you see my Under Armour sneakers, the, the sole of them were printed on our printer. And uh, it's, it's interesting to see just how this type of technology is being adapted in many different areas. And uh, just in the last week, sir, there was a, a press release. We've signed a significant contract with the U.S. Army that's led by uh, Chuck Hill Hull, who uh, invented 3D printing. And we're working with the Army to make the largest metal printer uh, that exists in the world and the fastest speed. So lots of exciting things going on in the world of 3D printing. So as all these different markets and technologies are adopting, we offer this full suite of services to help our customer evolve. It's important that we leverage our skills most efficiently on helping our customers here. So the technology, uh, I've always used technology in my career, and a lot of it's used to automate. So when we look at Salesforce and we implemented last year ServiceMax and we use Excel and Top Oracle, those tools help us automate. Now, when we start adding things like uh, PTC ThinkWorks for IoT and Aquano IO for AI, we're now getting into really tools that allow us to work differently and to work smarter. So it, it's a real change in, in what we can do with technology today. Because in our customers, they need much higher uptime, much quicker response time. And I'm going to pause a little there and let Chris talk a little bit about the, uh, you know, what Aquant's doing and their mission, then I'll come back and explain how we use the tool and how we got to where we are. Great. Thanks, Mark. Um, I think talking about uptime is a good segue to, to introduce what Aquant does and uh, talk a little bit about our intelligent triage solution. Uh, so this is an artificial intelligence engine uh, designed specifically to identify problems and prescribe solutions at the very first point of contact. Uh, it's built on the premise that most service organizations have the information they need to predict what the problem is going to be before they actually take action. Right? So the challenge is uh, for, for most of these organizations that the information that they need is, as you had described, scattered in, in different backend systems, um, perhaps uh, you know, ERP, CRM, um, you know, different systems that you've acquired over the years. Um, the, the, the most insightful data is going to be contained in those, those free text comments, right? So we believe that of all the data that your organization will look at, we, we think that the, um, uh, the free text comments are going to contain the, the golden nuggets, if you will. And we also believe that the most important information is, is captured in, in the brains of our best employees, right? So our, our, our field technicians that have been here for 5, 10, 15 years. Um, and there's, there's a definite need for us to be able to extract that information um, to be able to solve this problem. So let me advance up here. So what is the first thing that we do? So the first thing that we do is uh, we're going to pull that information from all of these different systems. So if you can think of um, the information in ERP that might be related to uh, a service ticket, or if you can think of uh, emails that might be related to a, a service request, or information in your CRM related to a service request and the workforce management. Uh, what we do is <clears throat> we take all those um, those individual views, those um, those lenses uh, through the, the the service order, 
and we create a superset of data, right? And so then uh, what do we do with that, with that superset of data? The first thing we do is um, we, we attack the free text comments, right? So we're going to go through and train our system how to speak your vernacular, right? So if your customers are, are reporting a leak, there may be dozens of different ways that they, they report that to, uh, to you. They could be describing it on the phone. They could be sending it in via email. But certainly very important information for us to determine that this is a symptom of that problem. Uh, then considering all the solutions, right? It, it's, it's impossible to structure uh, data and the collection of data to describe what you, how, how you're solving these different problems, right? And so what we found is that most of this information is contained in the free text comments. So as an example, a software update, you may have a technical support rep or a technician have, um, again, dozens of different ways to describe what a, a software update is. So by doing this, we actually have the ability now um, to uh, to capture this information and turn it into a, a structured format so that we can leverage it with, with our machine learning, right? And so then moving on, once we've pulled the information in, we've extracted the, you know, the, the insights that we can from the free text comments. Uh, we then leverage our machine learning engine to, to uh, build out the intelligent triage solution. Right. And so our, what we found in our, our experience is that the data in the machines and the algorithms will get us a certain percentage of the way there. Maybe it gets us 80% of the way there to solve the problem. But what we found is that um, by creating an expert mode where we can bring your subject matter experts into the process, they can help us to refine what uh, the actual solution is going to be. Right. So if uh, you have... Uh, questions that you want to you want to ask uh, to help triage the solution to troubleshoot the solution, and you say ask questions one, two, then three. You may have a, a subject matter expert or a technician come in and say, "No, I think you're asking that in the wrong uh, order. Let's ask question one, then three, then two, and then after you ask question two, let's let's listen for this or let's check for this, you know, to determine what the next step will be." Um, we found that by combining uh, the, the machines, so the artificial intelligence, and the person, so the, the, your subject matter expert, we've got fantastic results. Um, so, Mark, with, with your permission, I'd like to hand it back off to you to talk about um, how you've built intelligent triage into your service process uh, and what it might look like for, uh, for, your, for your end users. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Chris. So. The customer has an issue. Typically, they, they may try to figure it out themselves, try to resolve it. So it's important for the service organization to understand that when our clock starts, the clock has actually started somewhere upstream for the customer. So time to res resolution is important. They may try to use you know things in the community, knowledge notes and stuff, but eventually they come into support. And as I was saying before, on certain technology now, we've been able to make a level one, level two, because we're leveraging the, the quant technology to help us triage. And I don't need the you know the super expert here starting on the call. We may go to level two. We may go right right past them, depending on what the issue is. But it'll also help us with the parts prediction. We'll dispatch the right person, get the work done, resolve the issue. So that's kind of the the, the flow. Now, I'll take you through an example. But here, this is a screenshot, and those of you that use Salesforce and Service Max, you probably recognize it looks something similar to what you have. But this is where it starts. You have a case in, in Salesforce, and in the, the middle here, we have this button diagnosed with Stark. And uh, just a you know, small analogy, in the Avengers, uh, while Stark was maybe the most intelligent Avenger, he didn't rely on everything in his own brain. He used uh, AI and a lot of other uh, you know, means to be able to get to solutions faster. Exactly what we're doing here, right? So you hit the button, and this is what comes up. This pre-populates on the left, and it starts asking questions. And the questions are built up from all the the cases and information that we've you know captured over time, knowing what types of things could happen. Now on this, what is the problem? Build failed is a very broad topic, right? Trying to make a part and it's not coming out right. 
but that is where we're starting. So we, we click on that and it'll bring up, you know, it shows us here, green check here, and it brings up the next question. And this question again comes from the collective information that we have globally that has come together in the system. And as we step through, another question, is there a temperature problem? We say, we say yes, and now we have answered uh, yes to the first question, no to the second and third question, yes to the fourth question, and the prediction here is, you can see by the bar here, a high percentage of time this is going to be the black body. And to what Chris was saying before, if tech support's working with the, the field engineer, um, typically they'd be going through, you know, this, uh, check motion, did that work, right, yes, no, and it would take, there would be some iteration here just in time putting the tool in the, in the hands of the person that's in touch with the customer or in front of the customer just saves a lot of time. So now we know with a high probability for this type of issue on, on this printer, what came in, it's going to be um, the, the black body, okay? So getting back to the results, that, as you can see, there is three possible parts before that could solve that problem but we're probably now only going to send the one, which is reducing parts consumption. And the, the confidence we have in solving is a lot higher. So we think, you know, this is helping the, the team educate, uh, get smarter. Uh, it's, it's leveraging knowledge we have in the company, but leveraging it in a different way. Um, we run service as a P&L. So this assists us improving our financial performance. And the customer experience is greatly enhanced as we're resolving issues a lot quicker. So organizational impact. To talk a bit about uh, better utilization of employee skills. So with tiered support, we're leveraging the right people and the right types of problems. And you're also creating kind of a level of career growth for people because they're they're moving on to, to tougher challenges in their day-to-day -day job. Collaboration with engineering. Engineers love data. So the better we can get on providing data and what's, you know, what kind of problems we're having, what's resolving it, the better we can have those conversations. What do we want them to work on for us to improve the overall quality of our systems? And then with the supply chain, that becomes optimized and our supply chain people like it because we're requesting less parts to go out. So the logistics has, you know, they, they have to pull off the shelf less parts, they have to ship less parts. Um, and for the planners, we're using less parts and we're using the parts we need. So we're getting better at planning, improving the availability of inventory, and we're seeing our total inventory levels come down. So there's a lot of uh, knock-on benefits that happen by you know just getting smarter at what you're doing. Well, Chris, I'll cover a couple more topics and then I'll come back with a, a few more points. Great, thanks, Mark. Um, so I wanted to cover the topic of the neural network because it's it's so important to what we do here at Aquant. Uh, it's really at, at the foundation of everything that we're doing and actually goes back even to the charter of our business, which again is to uh, identify problems and prescribe solutions at the very first point of contact. Uh, back then, the goal was to eliminate repeat visits, right? So we knew from our experience in field service that 20 to 30% of all uh, technician visits were actually repeat visits, right? And so we felt that there was a really great opportunity there to gain some efficiencies. Uh, the question was, could we solve this um, the, this with technology and, and, and to, to come up with that answer uh, the first thing that was looked at was can we solve it without technology right so um, the, the simple answer is yes right so if we take the smartest people we have so the, the, the guys the engineers the technicians that have been around for 5 10 15 years that, that know the equipment inside out if we put all those people on the phone with customers as they call in we're going to be able to solve that problem. We're pretty sure of that. However, it creates a different problem that it's just not realistic. Um, it's just not something that can scale. Uh, so it, it, it wouldn't work in the real world. So, but it, 
uh, for, the, for the purpose of uh, designing an AI engine, the concept is that if these answers actually exist in someone's brain somewhere, then uh, then it, they, there's probably a good chance that they ex also exist in the data. So um, the effort was to study the neural network, the data for uh, that each service organization has, right? So we're looking at um, the service neural network. Right. So as we start to look at it and to see if those, uh, if that data actually does exist, the first thing that we look at is the service request. So in our world, the service request is kind of the, the center of the universe, if you will, right? So all information is really going to be related to that. So if you look at just what information might be on the service request, uh, you're going to see things like uh, the duration, the technician, um, the, the customer, the contract, are there IoT alerts, right? And so as we start to um, look at this information, the next step is to take a look at information that be, might be further related two or three steps away, right? And so as you consider the neural network for service, it can become quite extensive. So as we're looking at this, trying to see does this solution actually exist somewhere in there? Can can we pull that data and make this prediction at the first point of contact based on what we've seen historically? Uh, the answer is yes, right? But the problem was that the answer doesn't exist in structured data. So if it was, it was in structured data, it would be a much simpler problem to solve. Um, what we realized was that the, the answer did exist, but it existed in all the free text comments. So what we've learned in our, um, you know, our philosophy is that those comments contain all the golden nuggets, right? And so uh, the, the engine that we needed to build would actually extract that information so that we would actually have um, more information now about symptoms and solutions, right? And so what we found in doing so is that we're able to solve this problem and build intelligent triage to help predict the problems and prescribe the solutions as early as possible. Um, the discovery that we made above and beyond that is that once we've enriched this neural network and we've kind of supercharged it here with the information in, in the free text comments and then also um, with this information about symptoms and solutions, we now have um, identified that we can solve lots of other problems too. And actually, I should correct myself. So our customers have learned about the power of this neural network, and they're now coming to us to ask us to help solve other problems. Um, two, two examples are uh, capacity planning and workforce uh, planning um, uh, s situations, right? So if you think about having all of your data in one place, you now know um, how many different types of jobs you're going to have, right, the different solutions. You can now have a better judgment of what the time it takes to, to perform these jobs, right? Uh, you know where your technicians are. You know how much travel they may have associated to it. We can also build in um, sales forecasts. We can factor in things like weather. Um, we're now in a really good position to help um, solve some problems related to capacity planning and, and workforce planning. Um, another topic it relates to IoT, so device alerts. Um, and so our initial approach on this was that we felt um, these alerts that would come from machines would actually just help to make our intelligent triage engine um, more accurate. The predictions would be more accurate. But what we've been pleased to see is that above and beyond just that single use case, is that there's an opportunity here for us to help make IoT more effective, right? So if you think about, um, you know, the millions of alerts that devices are sending off, it sometimes is very difficult to determine what's noise and what's important, right? And so now that we have a powerful engine, it's machine learning, now that we've developed a neural network that um, contains information about symptoms and solutions, um, we're now able to better find and identify correlations between these different types of alerts. So um, this helps us to, you know, to be in a position to really start approaching uh, predictive, right? So if you can identify uh, correlations and combinations of alerts that happen before a machine breaks down, 
um, this is something that's going to make you much more effective in preventing that machine from going down and, and improving your uptime. So we've been very pleasantly surprised with um, with some of the benefits of having this really enriched neural network. Um, I'll, I'll hand it off to Mark to talk a little bit about how he's uh, you know planning to to leverage it in the future. So Mark, uh, over to you. Okay, thank you. So talk a little about lessons learned and, and how we're planning to use this going forward. So lessons learned, one, uh, before I knew much about artificial intelligence, just personally, my own personal view, I don't like the name artificial. It makes you think something's fake. I like thinking of it as augmented intelligence or additive intelligence, but that's where you start. You start with explaining to people what is this, right? This technology is not a replacement for your people, but as on that slide earlier you saw from Chris, it combines the AI intelligence with your tribal knowledge, and the team is in control and they can help guide the tool. So it, it's a partnering technology. So it's important to make sure people understand, you know, what what AI is, what we expect to accomplish with it, and and as people start using it, they they just start seeing more possibilities. So. One of the things we're doing, we will be, you know, we're using it currently for all our hardware printer support. Um, not on all technology that's rolling out on other technologies now, but we're going to bring uh, our software support team into Salesforce, and they will be able to start using the tool as well. And we look at, then we can, uh, for both partners on hardware and software and customers on software, eventually pushing out some of this uh, triage right to the, the customer, the partner level. The next thing is coming predictive. So in that, that network, that service request, we want to see the majority of them in the future come from our printers, not from our customers. That's part of becoming uh, more proactive, increasing uptime. So the IoT connectivity is very important, and that's, that's our 3D Connect uh, program. So this flow, we've cut out a couple steps there, we're getting much better data because it's coming from the machine, it's not being interpreted by a user on what's happening. With that data uh, going into the AI tool, we should be able to get even closer to, to what is the right solution and then uh, resolving that. So going forward, we want to initiate by IoT, uh, become more and more pro proactive and eventually get to what we could say is, is a true predictive type solution that you know, I, I know now schedule someone to be at a customer in two weeks because that's when we're going to need to change something. So there's a lot of uh, opportunity that, you know, the technology opens up for you. And uh, no, I'm just uh, very happy with the progress we've made so far and, and that it, you know, was so easy to implement. So Louise, I think we'll go back over to you if there's any questions that have come in or are coming in to the, the call. Yeah, of course. Uh, so we have a couple of questions from our attendees, and I'll just run through a few of them. Um, looks like this first one is for Mark. Uh, this attendee is asking, how long did it take you to get the Aquant platform up and running? Uh, good, good question. Uh, so we decided to go with a quant in 2018. Uh, it was in, it was at the end of the first quarter, so we're already in our fiscal year, and IT is already doing an Oracle upgrade. They're helping us implement ServiceMax, and we're putting up all this other stuff, and IT says they're, you know, not taking any new projects. So it took a little long to convince them that this would go easy, because uh, they didn't quite believe it, but this, this was a pretty easy implementation. The professional services from team from a quant worked with our technical support team. We, we needed hours and days from the IT, not weeks and months. And it was, uh, I think it was seven weeks total from when we started the project to when we went up. And part of that, we overlapped the end of the quarter and we don't make changes to the system. So um, this is probably one of the smoothest uh, type of, uh, you know, adding technology that I've, that I've done in my career. Right. Thanks for that, Mark. If I can add to it, um, yeah, we believe that most of our onboarding uh, engagement should last about seven weeks. Um, it, it's we're in a very unique situation where we're actually 
in control of most of our own fate. So we're not relying on heavy integration. Um, we don't need, um, you know, any large uh, SI partners to engage, which can also delay things. We don't need to do a lot of uh, um, whiteboarding and, um, and, and planning. Once we have your data, and we usually uh, go through a prototyping process called the seven-day challenge, um, where we actually go through and ensure that the data is rich enough for, for us to get the right results. So, so we're kind of have a head start on this. Um, the model is actually built in a way so that we do all the heavy lifting, and then what we do is we come in and we get engage, you know, Mark and his experts, you know, at certain points along the way to ensure that we're we're training the engine to speak his language the correct way, right? So to 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 learn the 3D systems vernacular. Fantastic. Um, all right, let's uh, dive into our next question. So this attendee is writing in asking, um, uh, Mark, did you have any pushback from your team when you were roll when you rolled out Aquan? Um, uh, there's always concern when you add technology, there's going to be pushback. But um, I was uh, pleasantly surprised how welcoming they were because um, if, you, if you ask the team before, they'd say, you know, they're they're overloaded. We need more people. So yeah, you can solve the problem by adding more people, but we looked at solving the problem by adding technology, so they were open to it, and uh, I, I think it adopted quite well. Um, and that, that's across the board, from the people in tech support, from the, the management of those teams, the, the other supporting parts of the organization. So uh, important on any change management is communication, what you're doing, why you're doing it, getting the people engaged, and by, by following those, you know, normal steps in change management, I think it set us up for success. Awesome. Glad it was a smooth transition. Um, and let's see if we've got time for one more question. Um, an attendee writes to us asking, uh, Chris, if I don't have Salesforce as my CRM system, can I still use a quant? Uh, yes, you can. So what what we saw in the uh, the session today is uh, a Salesforce interface, right? So the intelligent triage solution is available on the Salesforce App Exchange. Um, it uh, is also available through Service Max as remote triage, right? So if um, you're using uh, Service Max or if you're just on um, Surface Cloud with the, the Salesforce platform, then this, you know, the UI that you saw um, is available um, pre-built. Uh, we also have customers using um, on Microsoft. So if you think about, um, you know, the guts of what you're looking at with the intelligent triage solution, uh, the user interface is is probably um, the, the least heavy lifting that we would have to do. So if we needed to um, to recreate this uh, this UI inside of a different application. Um, I don't think that there would be a lot of heavy lifting to do that. But to answer your question, um, yes, you, you could use intelligent triage on, on any platform that you'd like. Excellent. And uh, with that, we're going to begin um, the closeout from today's session, um, hopefully give our attendees back some time before the top of the hour, get ready to get to their next meetings. Um, but before that, I just wanted to ask Chris and Mark if you have any final thoughts or key takeaways that you want to leave our audience with today. As, as Mark said, so you know, I um, was at a WBR conference. That's where I met a quant. I didn't know what they were doing, what they had, but uh, going into it, meeting with uh, Shahar and Asaf and, and hearing what they had got me intrigued. I did the seven-day challenge, as Chris mentioned. In the seven-day challenge, we already learned things that uh, probably just in the seven-day challenge helped us uh, pay for the entire investment, right, because it, it really identified where we were spending money where we shouldn't be. So, it you know, it, it's like anything, if, if you go in uh, – open-minded, uh, you can learn a lot. And we, we find this, you know, I talk about different technologies we've implemented and are leveraging. A lot of those are going to help us just streamline processes. But I think this type of technology is going to really bring us to be uh, ahead of the game against any of our competitors. 
Thanks for that, Mark. Um, I, I, I agree. I, I believe that the intelligent triage can be applied in lots of places. Um, I would encourage anyone in the audience to think about the neural network and how we can apply it in your service organization. Um, certainly being able to identify problems and prescribe solutions at the first point of contact should, should help many, many service organizations. Um, but I believe the true power here uh, is is really in having helping you to build that really complete, perfect view of, of uh, the the service uh, the service ticket, right? The, the 360 view of the uh, uh, of the service order. Um, so as as you start to look at it, you know, please reach out to us. We're happy to do a seven day challenge. It's actually pretty easy for us to get your data. Um, we train the system how to speak the language on maybe just one or two use cases, and we come back and we can show it to you literally on on your data. So then we can go back and also say, if we had this uh, information, you know, at the start of this data, here's the impact that it would have had if we were able to make better decisions. So, um, you know, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. We're happy to, to talk it through, and we're happy to um, to determine whether or not it's the right fit for your for your organization. Thanks, Elise. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Mark and Chris. Um, really enjoy your discussion, and I definitely know our audience did as well. Um, so to our attendees, thank you again so much for taking time out of your day to join us. Um, we'll be following up with you shortly if there are any additional questions that you want to send through. Um, we have a feedback survey at the closeout of this session. So it's where you can leave suggestions for future topics, let us know any feedback from today's session, um, as well as any additional questions that you might have, um, and we'll be able to follow, follow up with you as soon as possible. Um, you can look forward to receiving a copy of this on-demand presentation about 24 hours from now. Um, so keep a lookout uh, within your mailbox. It's going to be an email from On24. And with that, I will bring it, this program to its end. So on behalf of Aquant and 3D Systems, the field service team, and the WBR Insights team here at Worldwide Business Research, I want to thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you for your time, and have a great rest of your day. So until next time, everyone, take care. <laughs>